I'll give a few more minutes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a Think Summer School for, you know, hosted at the Purdue University. And uh, this afternoon session is uh, Geomatics Engineering and the UAB 3D Mapping session. And uh, this uh, session will be uh, streamed through the YouTube Live. And uh, also, we are going to be using something called you know, Purdue Hotseat as a you know, real-time interaction platform. So what I want to do before we get started today is you know, going to the course website and to give you a you know, brief introduction how to use you know, Hotseat in this session. So if you go to switch my screen to a computer, and uh, this is a uh, you know, course website, I believe you, sh you know, all of you have an already access to. And from this one, what you can see, do is you know, click content from there. And scroll down at the left column, there is gonna be a, oh, I think I scroll down too much. Geomatics Engineering and UAB 3D Mapping, Live School of Civil Engineering, you just click that. And let me just turn off this one. Go back up here. And actually, this is uh, in a video link that uh, you guys are probably watching already. And the second item from the menu is you know, called Hasset. So I want you to click this link over here. And uh, I already logged in using you know, my Purdue you know, credential. So I'm seeing already this screen already, but uh, for those of you who is just logging in this in Hasi for the first time, you know, you may have to use your, you know, Purdue credential to log in. So I will give wait about a minute or two so that you guys can log into the system. And while you guys are working on it, and if you have any questions, uh, this YouTube Live have a you know, chatting you know, capability, so leave your question on a chatting window, and we'll try to address those questions as soon as possible. Okay, I'll give you a little about another 30 seconds before we go into the actual, you know, hot seat activity. Okay, another 10 seconds, I would say. Okay, once you are in here, and you will see this in you know, a Think Summer Stat 19000 course, and uh, there is a you know, topic, it says the Geomatics Engineering UAB 3D Mapping. I want you to click that. And from there, and there is a you know, two menu uh, at the top over here, and what I want to you know, use in this session is you know, polls. So I'm gonna just you know, activate these polls over here and I'm going to ask you guys a first question. So where are you now? So I just want to have a you know, quick idea where you guys are located right now. Some of you might be in West Lafayette, like we are located here. You are maybe in, the, in the Indiana, or you know, I want you to know whether you guys are somewhere other state than Indiana or even outside of the United States as well. So I'm going to start this uh, poll right now. And uh, once you're in hot seat, uh, system, you should be able to see, you know, this poll is going on right now. Then I can see that, you know, actual response is going up. It's pretty good. And I see currently 47 viewers in the live stream. So I will wait until this, you know, response, you know, getting close to those, you know, 47 numbers. 42. Let's say I'm going to give you another 20 seconds before I close the poll. That's 44. And I have 48 viewers. So I think there's a couple of you who hasn't answered yet. But uh, for the you know, limited time, you know, the, I'm going to stop it. But the, we are going to be doing this in HACI polls you know, throughout this session you know, multiple times. So I'm going to stop. And let's see the results over there. So majority of you actually about you know, 32% of you actually are within Indiana, and there's none of you from outside the United States, which is good. 
And uh, okay, this is a good exercise. So with this, uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to introduce Dr. Ayman Habib. And uh, Dr. Habib is going to give us our first you know, part of this in you know, a session where he's going to be introducing what is geomatics engineering in the UAV 3D mapping. And after that one, we're going to have a live uh, UAV or you know, drone in you know, a data collection demo. And after that one, uh, we're going to be showing you how to process those data set to generate the 3D model out of it. And with that, I'm going to introduce a Dr. Habib. So good afternoon, everyone. I think yeah, every one of you, even if you are on the West Coast, this afternoon for you. So good afternoon. And uh, as Dr. John said, we will be talking about the um, geomatics engineering. So maybe we'll start with the poll. So now let's see if I can go back to the poll. And um, so. The first question which I have for you is, have you ever heard about the term geomatics engineering? So we have some responses. We have eight, nine. So I'll give you 20 seconds. So again, the question is that, have you ever heard about geomatics engineering before? So we have 32, 36. Thirty-eight. So, okay. So, five seconds. Okay. So I'll stop the polling right now, and then we'll view the results. So, I'm not surprised. The far majority of you have not heard about geomatics engineering before. So let's follow this one with a couple of other questions. Uh, so my next question to you, have you ever uh, used a paper map? So this is my second poll. In your previous past, did you ever use a paper map or not? So I'll give you 10 seconds. I'm getting lots of responses now. So we have 43. Okay. So I'll stop the poll now, and then let's look at the results. So 84% of you said that they have used paper maps. Okay, so we'll follow this with another couple of questions, and then we'll get into the topic of geomatics engineering. So let me ask you this question here. How many of you have a smartphone. So I'll give you five seconds, and then we'll see. OK, so I'll stop the poll now, and let's view the results. 100% of you have a smartphone, which is quite good. Let's follow uh, this with another question here. Let's see. This is the one. Any one of you has used Google Maps or Apple Maps or any type of uh, map application in your smartphone? So we have lots of responses coming, so I'll wait another five seconds. I'll stop the poll now, and then let's view the results. As expected, hopefully you can see this one. 100% of you have used uh, uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps. Let's see what is if there is another question that we need to answer, yes, let me ask this question here. Have you been in a 3D movie theater before? So 
So five seconds, and then I'll stop the pool and we'll look at the answers. So you can see I have like very like 98% have been in a movie theater. So now let's go back to the uh, presentation. So although as expected, not many of you have heard about the term geomatics engineering, but now I claim that you already have used geomatics engineering technology. So let's start with the dictionary definition of um, geomatics engineering. So the geomatics engineering is the science uh, which is dealing with the mathematics or the, the science that describes the shape of the Earth or the analysis of any data collected to the Earth's surface. And another definition we say that we are acquiring data, we are managing or modeling data about the Earth's surface. So one of these things is basically like Google Maps. So Google Maps, these are data collected by satellite imagery, high resolution satellite imaging system, uh, roving around, like uh, moving around the Earth, and then we're collecting these high resolution data. And these are one of the data sources we use for geomatics engineering. So in geomatics, it's basically an application which be, or a field that is, relies on applied science where we use uh, scientific concepts and inventions for solving problems related to our daily, everyday life. And it's basically a profession that spans the fields of engineering, uh, land management, and law as well. So the term of law actually might be a little bit um, strange. How is this related to geomatics? But for us, actually, in geomatics engineering, we are quite interested in property mapping or boundary mapping of our properties, whatever we own. So this is used to, uh, or estimated by or determined by geomatics technologies. So if you look into geomatics, we are collecting data related to the surface of the Earth. So we have data acquisition systems. Those data acquisition systems can be from space, like the imagery collected for Google Maps. It can be from uh, manned aircraft. It can be from unmanned aircraft. So later today, you will see a live demo of a, a geomatics tool, which is unmanned aerial vehicle or drone collecting imagery. And then we use this imagery to derive information about the area we fly over. And even the data collection can be from the ground. So basically, sometimes while you are moving, you will see people having systems on a tripod. That's what we call uh, total stations or levels, for example. So we take the data acquisition, we do some modeling, we relate the sensor measurements to the information we need to determine about the, the, uh, the ground, for example, an area of a map, the boundary of a property. We take this data and do some sort of analysis, like for example, we see how much of a change happened over a given area over time. Uh, the impact of a flood, for example, what, how big of an area is affected by the flood. And then finally, this data or this information goes to a decision maker to decide on what they need to do based on this data. So for example, if they have a map of a flooded area, based on that, they can decide on the best way to mitigate the impact of this flood. And the fields of geomatics engineering include earth observation. We do environmental monitoring. We do uh, like land use mapping, like and also boundary surveying, as well as 911 applications, GPS applications, so forth. So one of the neat things about the applications of the geomatics engineering, we have, although we started as a field mainly focusing on the development of maps, but right now we have applications in environmental monitoring, precision agriculture, infrastructure monitoring, uh, land resource management, and so forth, transportation, and so forth. So right now, we have lots of applications. And here, for example, these are some of the applications where we talk about infrastructure, monitoring, energy uh, sector, uh, precision farming, and uh, transportation management. So we have lots of developments in uh, geomatics engineering. We started as a field that's focusing on doing mapping from, let's say, uh, using total stations or sy systems on a tripod. and from aircraft systems to a large uh, uh, area of applications or fields using the technology. 
So for example, 911 applications, when you call for 911, they have a way of knowing where you are calling from. That's basically related to uh, GPS surveying. Change detection, monitoring an area over time and doing the change that happened and making uh, developing policies to evaluate how we can react to this change as well as the rescue application. All these uses uh, use uh, geometric technology. So I'll focus on a couple of areas in uh, geometrics engineering is what we call photogrammetry and LiDAR mapping. So photogrammetry, the name is coming from photography. So basically you have a camera, you take an image uh, of an object over an area, and you use this imagery which are collected to do measurements of your area of interest. And LiDAR is another technology which is based on a laser, which is uh, basically you shoot a beam and then you get a response. So the energy we work with is something called electromagnetic spectrum. So for example, we have radiation from the sun. The only type of radiation that we can discern by uh, our eyes is what we call visible light, which is light with a wavelength in the range of from 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers. So just to give you an idea, like one meter is 1,000 millimeters, one millimeter is 1,000 micrometers. So like the red, green, blue part of the spectrum is like 0.4 or 0.7 micrometers, which is 0.4 of one thousandth of a millimeter. For example, when we do a weather forecasting, we are using signals in radar. So radar, if you can look actually, so the wavelengths of radar is in the millimeter or meter range wavelengths. LiDAR wavelengths, we are talking about something in the range. So if you look at here, and hopefully you can see my mouse, LiDAR, we have a wavelength in the range of one or two microns. So we have lots of sensors we use in geometrics. So we have cameras, we have what we call LiDAR systems, and we use what we call GPS systems. So in the beginning of the course, I asked you how many of you have a smartphone, and every one of you have a very advanced geometrics technique. For example, your smartphone has a GPS receiver, an antenna. So using the GPS receiver on your smartphone, we can tell where you are. Uh, you have also something what we call attitude sensor in your smartphone. So if you hold your smartphone in the portrait and landscape mode, so actually the screen or reorients itself to match the orientation of the smartphone. So that's based on what we call orientation system or inertial measurement unit. So we have all these actually technologies on a very low cost on your smartphones and we have much higher end systems. So the, these sensors, we have what we call active and passive sensors. So a passive sensor like your camera, you hold your camera, you just click the button and then you have the light coming from the object space to your camera so we are seeing that this is a passive sensor it just reacts to the energy coming from the objects we take images of active sensors those are sensors basically they shoot a pulse and then the pulse goes to the object and comes back so i'll show you this example so if you look here at the screen what you see on the right part here so this is what we call passive sensors it's just you have a radiation coming to the sensor and then the sensor just records this energy. And that can be in the red, green, blue, or whatever wavelength of the spectrum. Active sensors, on the other hand, so the sensor initiates the, some, the energy emission. The energy goes to the object, and then it gets reflected back to the, uh, the sensor. So I'll show you a couple of examples about these uh, passive and active sensors or imagery and LiDAR systems. So again here, this is the formal definition of active and passive sensors. You, I don't need to repeat those again, sorry. So that's what we said here. Uh, uh, passive sensor, so for example, here you have the light coming from the sun. The light goes to the object, and then it will be reflected back to the sensor, and the sensor just records the reflected energy. When you talk about active sensors, so this is just an example of an aircraft system with a manned aircraft. So basically you fly over the area and you get an image of the object. An active sensor, as we said, the sensor initiates the radiation. So you have an energy going from the sensor to the object. And then some of the energy goes back from the object to the sensor. And this is an example of LiDAR. So these are just some examples of 
photogrammetric geomatic tools. Basically, as we said, all what we are trying to do is that we are trying to do mapping of the Earth's surface. We have platforms. Here I'm showing an example of manned aircraft systems. And we have products. For example, if you go to Google Maps, you can see actually uh, 3D city models. You can have actually maps that show you the elevation of the terrain. So all these are products. So we'll start right now with what are the key principles of photogrammetry. So in order to do 3D mapping, to get heights of objects, we have to have two images of the same object. So you can see here, this is the left image, this is the right image. And this area which is highlighted, this is the same area covered by the two camera stations. And then basically, if you can see the same object in the two camera station, we can use some mathematical modeling to do 3D reconstruction. So this is basically what we are trying to do in photogrammetry. We have an aerial flight. We collect some images. And from those images, we produce a 3D map. And that's the exercise you will be doing later today. Is, but using rather than using imagery from manned aircraft, you will use this one from unmanned aerial vehicle system. So we collect some imagery. Those imagery, they have overlap. So if you look at this, uh, the slides here, hopefully you can see my cursor. You can see this area here is imaged in different parts or on those different parts of those six images. So now let's do actually another exercise. So we'll go back to the hot seat. And I'll ask you for a simple exercise. So let's do this. I would like you to do this case. So in a way, actually, I would like you to hold the pencil. I'm not sure if you can see me. So yeah, you hold the pencil in front of your eyes, and then do this exercise. Just close one eye and open the other, and then keep switching this several times, and tell me what you see happening to the pencil. So I'll repeat the question again. Hold the pencil, look at it while closing it and opening one eye at a time without moving the pencil, and tell me what do you see. So you have these answers here. There is no changes. The tip of the pencil moves in one direction or another. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that. So maybe I'll repeat the question again. You are supposed to hold the pencil in front of your eye. Just uh, switch between one left eye and one right eye while looking at the tip of the pencil at a time. And then tell me what do you see happening to the tip of the pencil. So I'll give you 20 seconds. And I'll, I'll tell you actually why this is interested, uh, like why we are interested in this. And in the earlier, I asked you if you have been to a 3D movie theater. So that's exactly the same concept which is being used for uh, visualizing 3D movies. Uh, five seconds. Okay. So we have almost 40. Okay, so one comment. We just lost power. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so I'm not sure what. Okay, so, so yes. thank you very much, Dr. Zhang. So the, there is actually a recording, so you can go later and then catch this part. Sorry about that. So now uh, I'll stop the poll and then let's see the answers. Uh, view results. So 66% uh, of you actually had the right answer. So one or two percent said that there is no change. Uh, third, like thirty-two percent said actually they saw a motion of the tip of the pencil, but in the direction normal to the line connecting two eyes. So remember, I'm, I'm talking actually about this direction. So here you have a line connecting the left eye and the right eye. So. 66% of you said that, which is the right answer. When you hold the tip of the pencil, look at the top of the tip of the pencil, and you switch one eye at a time, you will see a displacement of the tip of the pencil in the line connecting the left eye and the right eye. So I'll give you a few seconds. So for those of you who did not see that, like whether you said that there is no change or the line is moving this way or the displacement in this direction, just to see whether this is really what's happening. But hopefully, all of you can see that you see a displacement in this direction, which I'll call it x direction, and that's related to x parallax. 
Okay? So now let's do this exercise, but with a slight change. So you repeat the, the, this process while doing the following. So hold the, the pencil very close to your eyes and do this switching, and then more or less evaluate this shift here in this direction. And then move the pencil much further and then do the test again. So I'm asking you to do the, have the pencils very close and just sort of describe the amount of shift relative to the shift when you see when the pencil is too far from you. So if you look at the, the answers, we have no change. That basically the amount of the shift is the same, regardless whether the pencil is close to you or farther from you. Or basically the shift gets larger as the object or the pencil is closer to my face. Or the third answer is that basically this shift gets uh, smaller when, oh, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> The second and the third one are more or less the same thing. So if you have the second or the third one, those would give you the same answer. Okay, so we have 33, 34. So I'll give you 10 seconds. So I'll stop now and view the results. So, yes, so actually if you answered, like you said, it gets larger when the object is closer to my face or it gets smaller when the pencil is farther from my face, that's exactly the same answer. So that's the correct one. So I hope that you can all of us do, repeat this again. If you have the pencil closer to your face, this amount of shift is quite significant. When it gets farther, the shift gets smaller and smaller. And that's basically how we can use our eyes to see things in 3D. So 3D, it means that you can see the third dimension or the depth. And that's the whole idea of photogrammetry, which is a very good tool in photogrammetric mapping. So I'll go back to the slides. And this concept is what we call the X parallax. So if you see here, actually, like when you have the object in the left and right image, you have this shift here, which is in the direction connecting the left eye and right eye. That's what we have seen. That's the X parallax. And this is the Y parallax, which is the shift in the opposite direction or the or direction orthogonal to this one. So I'm not going to get into this detail, but the key part here is that this, the things will look different by looking at it from two different locations. That's basically what allows us to see in three dimensions. So I'll skip this part here. So this is actually, if you use the, actually some of these toys that allow you to see 3D, that's basically the concept. So for example here, if you look at these two images of Thomas Edison, you can see actually they are not exactly the same image. And in order to tell or to make sure that they are not the same image, just look into like Thomas Edison's head and just compare it to the frame of the door behind him. So you can see actually in one of the images, his face looks a little bit farther from the frame and the other image looks closer. So again, here you see that you have an X parallax or a parallax in the direction connecting the two eyes. And this is, gives you the depth. So if you look at these images using this device, which is we call a pocket stereoscope, you can see in 3D. That's another device, again, that allows you to see in 3D. You have two images. You have only parallax or shift in the direction of the flight. And then by looking at this here, you have 3D. So what do we do when we go to a 3D movie theater? When what we go, we do is that we have glasses. So we have glasses, we call them polarized glasses. And what actually you have on the screen of a 3D movie, you have two images on top of each other. And by having those glasses, actually, you can allow each eye to see one image at a time. You have the left eye sees the left image and the right eye sees the right image. And then your brain fuses them together. And that's how you see in 3D. So in photogrammetry, we do the same concept, but mathematically. So basically, we have two images. So if you look here, these are two images. There is a common area in between. And then we have what we call composite, something like that. So if you look at this here, actually, these are two images on top of each other. And if you use glasses like that, so some of the movie, actually, movies, uh, 3D movies, they use these types of glasses where you have 
one with a cyan filter, one with a red filter. So this allows you to see one image at a time, and based on that, you can see in 3D. What we do in photogrammetry is do this, but mathematically. So the exercise you will do today is we'll show you some of the processes that allows you to get 3D information from these two sets of 2D image. So the last technology I will talk about, which is LiDAR. So LiDAR basically is just you have a laser beam. So if you use a laser pointer, what you have is just a basically a laser beam. And then the beam goes from the laser to the object and coming back. And based on that, we determine the distance. So this is just an example of uh, an aircraft flying with a LiDAR unit. You have these thousands and thousands of pulses per second coming from the LiDAR unit. It flies over the area of interest and then you have actually at the end a 3D model. So now I will show you actually a technology that's basically using uh, 3D movies. Oh, sorry, it's a, the geomatics technology. So we'll go outside and then, it's okay. So basically if you look here, hopefully you still can see me and hear me. So this is uh, what we call a mobile mapping system. So some of you have seen maybe a Google car or an Apple car driving in your neighborhood. It has something similar to this technology, but this is a little bit more advanced. So if you look here, actually, maybe if you move here, so you have this mobile mapping system or this car, you see you have two cameras in the front. So you have a left camera and a right camera. So these are the, you see the lenses of the camera. And then there is another camera in the back and then Beside the cameras, you have this, uh, like these silver cans, those are LiDAR units. So just to give you an idea, like this LiDAR unit here, which has like velodyne written underneath, this is, uh, emits like quarter million pulses per second. They go to the object and then they are reflected back. So this vehicle here is moving along the roads, collecting data with the cameras, as well as the LiDAR units. So we have three images from the three different cameras, one image per second. In average, actually, we have almost like three million pulses or LiDAR pulses come to the vehicle. And then all the stuff is recorded on a computer in the hard disk, and then we come to the office. So I'll show you some of the data sets that are collected here. So this is one of the applications of geomatics engineering where we are using geomatics technologies for uh, road asset management or for transportation application. So if you can see here, as we said, that we have a left camera and we have a right camera. So you can see the images are not exactly the same, but basically because they are, have two cameras, we are driving along the road and then we are capturing uh, an image every one second. So as we have seen in the, uh, in the vehicle, we have again two cameras which are looking forward and one camera which is looking backward. While we're driving, if you just remember, look at this part here. So we have a crash or a, an accident on the other side of the road. So we are driving here almost like with 40 mile per hour speed. And then we have the imagery and the LiDAR. So whatever information you can see here, you can derive 3D objects or 3D cones. And this is the LiDAR data. So hopefully you can see here, this is the LiDAR data. This is the lane we were driving on. That's the concrete barrier between the northbound and southbound direction of the road. You can see this is the accident. This is the car, which is like a trailer, which is on its side. And you can see some people here standing around this stuff. So basically you have this information. You can measure distances and you can evaluate this information here just while you are driving with a speed of 40 miles per hour. So this is one of the neat applications of geomatics is that basically you can collect data. In this case, we have a, a vehicle collecting imagery and LiDAR data. We come to the office and then we can do the measurements or we can produce the 3D maps. So imagine actually if you want to do this stuff in the field, you go there into the field and let's say with a tape measure, you are trying to determine distances or objects. So basically there, you have a very dangerous environment. You have traffic going in both directions and you are trying to determine information about this crash scene. Why this is important, for example, for insurance applications, the police would like to know or would like to reconstruct the, um, the, 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 the crash. How did it happen? Who is the person at fault for insurance claims 
as always also for uh, like uh, legal claims. If someone was excessively driving over the speed limit or basically driving in the wrong directions of the road, for example. So I'll just conclude actually by showing you some applications of uh, UEVs in 3D mapping. So you can actually, any one of you who can go to Costco or Best Buy, you can buy a drone system. So these are examples actually of UEV systems which you can buy off the shelf. Like for example, these Phantom, these are from DJI. This is in the range, yes. So this is in the range of um, $2,000. This is another example here. This is also a DJI Mavic Pro. So this is again, very small system. And then you can see here, it has a camera here. So basically, in this camera, you can rotate it to look at different directions. And this will give you the imagery and you can do 3D information or 3D mapping from those types of drones. So this is a, just to give you an example, like I would say 10, 15 years ago, we were using manned aircraft systems with multi-million dollar equipment and platform to do the mapping. Right now we can use a system which is like a couple of thousand dollars to give us products of the same quality as what we used from these manned aircraft systems. So you can also have like more sophisticated drones that collect this data. So this is some of the work, for example, we are using was precision agriculture. So I will just use the last five minutes to show you some of the applications where we have been using uh, drones for solving important problems. So for example, crash scene read documentation, as I mentioned, this is very important that basically whenever you have a crash happening on a highway, you have the ambulance, the fire, uh, come to the scene. They would like to make sure to, to, to take the victims out. And also you have what they call forensic officers. So some of you have seen the CSI. So basically the forensic officers, they collect measurements in the field. And what they are trying to do is that they basically are trying to recreate the dynamics of the crash to determine the party who's at fault. So this is just an example of a crash scene. If you are in Indiana, you know I-65, which is going from, let's say, Chicago to Indianapolis. So this was a, a crash that happened on September 12, 2019. So you can see here we flow with the UEV. It's quite similar to this UEV, which I showed you. So this is actually, if you look at this one here, this is a UEV that collected the data, which is exactly this similar to this UEV. So they flew on a couple of flight lines. So you can see those are the images from the first flight line. And then they make a U-turn, and then they capture a set of images. So hopefully you can see here, actually, this is the, the actual scene. So they're basically were stopping traffic. There was a, a, a semi coming from the back, did not know that the traffic was stopped, so they rammed into the, another uh, stopping traffic. So we take this actually here images. So in this case, if you look at this one, we call this one orthophoto mosaic. So this orthophoto mosaic, that's more or less the same thing which you, you see in a Google map. You have lots of images collected from different locations. They are stitched together. So basically the police officers, they look into the skid marks. They basically from the skid marks and from the profile of the skid marks, they can determine the speed of the driver when he was approaching the stop in traffic, whether he stopped the, uh, like pushed the brake or not. So having this data set, actually, you can recreate the dynamics of the scene. Another application, again, I'm talking about some of the new applications of geometric engineering other than the production of 3D maps. So this is some work which has been done uh, together with a collaboration in, with a group in Turkey for the documentation of archaeological site. So the site is exactly in the um, south center uh, of Turkey. There is an island here in the Mediterranean, which is called uh, Boksak Island. So I'm just zooming in on Google Maps to show you where is the island. So this is basically the island that we were trying to survey. And this is basically here, this is uh, like this is the, uh, we were mapping the west side of the island. So th this island actually here, this is the nature of the eye area. And they wanted, to, what they had here actually, they have some castles, very old castles actually coming more or less lead, um, to the late Roman uh, age. And they really are trying to investigate what is the reason or what was the, um, 
the settlement, the type of settlement. Is it really used for shipbuilding? Is it used for quarry? And that's what they are trying to do. Just to give you an idea, so basically the traditional way of doing this uh, mapping and doing documenting the, the, the scene and the island, they have a sketch and then they move around and they do those sketches, they do measurements with tapes. So they have been working on this site almost like for 40 years, collecting some images, doing some sketches to describe what is in the island. And this is will allow them to actually determine what's there. And one of the hypotheses is they're there because they can see quarry cuts. They are trying to see whether these uh, quarries were done actually to build uh, buildings on the island or basically to take the, the, the stones to build somewhere outside the island. So this is basically what is the, 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 the area, how we get there, you get with a boat, and we used actually a UEV system. So we took one of our UEVs, this is basically the system, and we flew there for four days. And what we have done was in those four days in terms of mapping the island is basically equivalent to what they have done in the last four years. So basically we flew over the area, we fly like three or four missions every day, each mission is roughly 15, 20 minutes. And that's basically what, just some images. So this is the data we collected over four days. So you can see in four days, we covered the whole west side of the island, which they have been surveying over four years. And then this is actually just an, like a digital surface model. Basically, blue is the lowest. That's basically the shoreline. Red, that's the highest. So this is actually a very steep slope. It's not really easy to move and do the measurements. And they had to do actually uh, clear some of the, um, the vegetation in the area. So these are just some views of the areas. And then one of the neat things actually, because in this, this island was in the Mediterranean, the only source of uh, fresh water they had is that they had cisterns. So basically, if you look at this one here, they had actually a hole actually, and this was collecting the uh, rainwater. So in the LiDAR data, because LiDAR actually uh, gives you the distances or you get 3D point cloud, so this is the basin or the bottom of this uh, system. So these are just some examples of these systems. You can see some of these systems here, so basically you have rocks covering the uh, system. But one of the neat things about the LiDAR technology, if you have very small opening or gap, some of the LiDAR B energy will go in between the rocks and then here, hopefully you can see there are some returns from the top, bottom of the basin here. So this is another one here. You can see this uh, cistern here is covered by vegetation. Again, some energy goes in between the leaves and you can get the bottom of the basin. And this is just an example. So this is again a bigger cistern. And then this is how the bigger cistern, you can even map the bottom of the uh, cistern. So one of the things I would like to say here before I conclude is that like imagery or using imagery is just one of the technologies. So for example, if you use imagery, you can only see the visible surface. So for example, here you cannot really map the bottom of the system. But if you combine this with another technology like LiDAR, you can get a 3D map of something which is below the visible surface. So I, that's the whole idea right now. You can see the old walls in the imagery and then the LiDAR data. So again, the LiDAR data is colored in a way red is high and then blue is low. So you can see here, you can see the cistern, which is used to collect the rainwater uh, here, very low, and then the vegetation here. So this is another system and so forth. So this is, an, again, a LiDAR data where you can see the walls and this is the corresponding imagery. So you can use this data and you can even, what we have what we call 3D point clouds. So you can have 3D visualization where basically you have the color information from the imagery and the 3D point clouds from the light. And that's really what is the nice thing about uh, photogrammetry. So for example, right now, uh, virtual tourism, you can do that. So basically you can have very accurate, very precise 3D model of historical sites so you can visit them just while you are looking at your screen. Uh, again, for heritage documentation or protection, you can have a very accurate digital copy of the objects. And then if you have any problem, you can restore this object. So that's sort of a, a very quick glance of what geometrics engineering, and let me recap again, it's basically a science and a, a discipline that these was the 3D modeling or 3D in, uh, representation of our environment. 
It can be outdoor, it can be indoor, it can be above ground, below ground, it can be even below the ocean surface. And we have lots of technologies from satellites, from manned aircrafts, unmanned aircrafts, from wheel-based systems like what we see, we saw outside uh, with the vehicle. We can even use un unmanned ground vehicles or even uh, underwater robots. So thank you very much. And I'll, uh, Dr. Uh, Sun will uh, proceed now to give you more information about geomatics. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sun. Uh, I'm tr today, I'm going to show you how to uh, set up the uh, flight, mission, flight mission for 2D mapping purposes. Uh, so today, we are going to use the Mavic Pro, Mavic 1 Pro, and a mission planning software called uh, Pix4D Capture. Of course, you can use different uh, kind of uh, mo uh, drones or uh, mission planning software uh, based on, uh, depending on your experience, your drone models, etc. So, I'm, uh, I'll first show you uh, the drone first. This is the uh, Mavic 1 Pro. Here's the battery. It lasts about uh, 15 minutes. And here's a remote controller antenna that sends a signal to the drone. And here, the tablet or smartphone you can use to uh, make a flight mission. And finally, a small SD card you can use to store the data. So now I'm going to show you how to uh, set up the flight mission with the PIX4D capture. So, okay, here's the home screen of the tablet. Of course, you can use uh, smartphones and any kind of Android. Apple tablet you can use. So from the home screen, you can first click the uh, mission planning software. Today we're going to use the Pix4D capture here. Can you mention that it's also free to download? Oh, okay. And this is a, 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 a free software, so you can download it free. Okay, so this will be the first screen when you click on the software first. So go to the settings first, and always make sure you're, uh, you chose the right model and make. So in our case, we're going to use Mavic Pro, which is a DJI drone. And then uh, we're going to draw a grid mission. So what grid mission is, uh, uh, in grid mission, uh, UAV uh, flies, along, flies along the edge of the boundary and take a U-turn and go back and forth to hit the other end. So click the grid mission here. And then you'll see a map uh, of your location, 
and your area. So I'm going to make a mission around this place. And you can see the uh, yellow rectangle over here. You can change the size of the mission area by dragging the uh, edge or the corners of this rectangle, rectangle. And also you can rotate it and so on. So currently, uh, and you can also change the altitude or height of the uh, drone. So here you can see the height is currently 20 meter, which is 65 feet above ground. And on the left hand side, you see a GSD 0.66 centimeter per pixel, which means uh, ground sampling distance and what this means is uh, the, the size of each pixel on the ground in the UAV image. So each pixel it corresponds to 0.66 centimeter on the ground. And this 0.66 centimeter is about uh, a quarter of an inch. So if we change the height to 40 meters, which he will be, which is uh, 130 feet above ground. The GSD, the ground sampling distance, is 1.3 centimeter per pixel, which is a half of an inch. So today we're going to uh, draw a mission with uh, 30 meter by 30 meter in area extent and the altitude will be 20 meter, 65 feet. And so the uh, ground sampling distance or the size of each pixel on the UAV image will be 0 0.66 centimeter or a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to change the altitude or the height or the elevation to 20 meter. And the aerial extent, I'm going to change it to 30 meter by 30 meter. And here, the blue dot means our location. So, uh, so, okay. So everything is good for now. And now we're going to go to set the uh, image overlap. So Dr. Habib mentioned pretty much in detail about the image overlap. So in essence, uh, when image overlap increases, the quality of your uh, 3D model will also increase. So uh, we can see here front overlap 75%, side overlap 75%. So uh, what front overlap and side, front, uh, uh, side overlap means the overlap along the uh, course is the front overlap and uh, an overlap across the course or the, perpend uh, or the orthogonal to the main course will be the side overlap. So now it's set to 75%, which is good. Enough for this uh, demonstration. And uh, one thing I need to mention is uh, when you increase the uh, overlap to increase your quality of your 3D model, uh, the flight time will also increase. So as I mentioned before, the most of the uh, battery time for the recreational drones, this is around 15 minutes, only 15 minutes. So your flight time is over 15 minutes. You'll, uh, you'll need uh, multiple batteries or you can change the flight settings. So for example, you can decrease the overlap or you can increase your uh, altitude or height. So everything is good. So now we are go out, going out to 
to the real uh, fight. Okay. All right. So we just turned on the drone Mavic 1 Pro. And now we are seeing the uh, yellow flashing light here. Uh, can you come over here? So here uh, you see a yellow flashing light. Uh, Every drone maker and drone model has different meanings for this, but for this model, the yellow signal, yellow flashing light means uh, there's no signal from the remote controller. So now I'm going to turn on the remote controller. Okay. So we just turn it on and now we're seeing the green flashing light it means there is a connection between this uh, remote controller and the drone. So since uh, I have turned on all the drone, remote controller and also the, uh, uh, the tablet device, uh, we can upload this data we set before the mission, uh, flight mission data to the remote and to the drone. And in turn, we can also uh, the, uh, live stream the uh, images from the camera, from the drone to the tablet. Okay. So we are now going to start the mission we just drove. Uh, so we're going to open the project. The everything is good. The 20 meter altitude, the overlap is 75% here. And we see a, a location of our drone here. And this is actual extent of the uh, air, uh, flight mission. 
screen was very hard to see. Mm. But I think. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So we're going to start the mission. It's going to take off soon. So now it's taking off. So the altitude of the mission is uh, 20 meter. So it's going to the start point with that uh, 20 meter altitude and it will soon start collecting the data. Uh, I'm not sure you can see the screen now but uh, the exact location of the drone is shown on the screen. I'll, I'll make it brighter. You think you can come inside? The okay. The shadow? I think that that will show a little bit better. Okay. Any dark background? Okay. Yeah. So the uh, drone is going along the path which appears in the white line and it's going back and forth to cover the whole area with 75 image overlap. Now the mission has ended and it will increase its altitude to avoid the obstacles between the uh, end point and the uh, takeoff location. So it will go up to 100 meter which is pretty high. Now it's 80 meter and it starts landing. Now it's 50 meter. The 30 meter. You have to carefully watch uh, the, especially when the drone is landing because it can crash on your car, etc. 8 meter. 4 meter, 5 Okay, now the mission is success. I'll turn off the drone and also I'll turn off the remote. Okay. So the uh, here's the uh, it was the uh, the flight demo for the uh, Mavic Pro with uh, plan mission planning software called uh, Pix4D Capture. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, flight demo, and I hope you uh, 
uh, got a little bit more, uh, what's that? familiarize some words, uh, including the ground sampling distance, image overlap, et cetera. And now we're uh, moving on to MetaShape free trial, uh, the uh, MetaShape data processing with Joshua Carpenter. Send, they'll send you an email back, and this is an example of the email I got. It just says, hey, here's your trial license, and here's a link to download the, the data. Yeah, I, so, I'm sorry, I think I forgot to turn on and switch the audio, so I think there's a, you know, about a couple of minutes with no sound. So oh, I okay. We have to start again from the start. Back up. <laughs> sorry about that. All right, guys. Um, <laughs> start with, hey. Uh, it's, it's my turn to talk here. We're going to be talking about uh, Metashape. So this is a, a software that you can download that will allow us to take those 2D images that Sun collected out in the field, take those 2D images, and do what our eyes do naturally, and that is take 2D information and transfer, transfer, transform it into 3D information. How do, we, how do we go from 2D pictures to 3D um, information? So we're going to use a software called Metashape. And you can download this for free uh, from Agisoft, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So the first thing you're going to need to do is uh, go to Agisoft, follow this link, and you can, <clears throat> you can give them your name, your email address, and they'll send you a license for a 30 days free trial. So this is an example of the email I got back from Agisoft. It just says, here's the license number, and um, here's the link that you can use to install, or to go install. So you're gonna go out, follow that link. It'll take you to a page um, on Agisoft's website. And here you'll just download the appropriate, uh, use the, you wanna download the professional edition, but find whatever's appropriate for your system. Install that. And just like any other software, follow the installation wizard um, to install. Once it's installed, then you'll open up um, the program on your computer and it will ask you for a license. Go back to that email that Agisoft sent you, plug in that license, and you're ready to go. Okay, and the last thing on this slot, this PowerPoint which you have access to is a link to some of the data that um, we're going to demonstrate a little later in, in the presentation. So that link's there for your viewing after the video. Okay. So to demonstrate, I've already um, opened up um, Metashape on my computer for you. And the very first thing you're going to do is, uh, I'll give you a, an overview of the windows. You have your workspace on the left side here, and this just shows you the type of data that's in your project. And then on the right side is where you're generally gonna be viewing your information. So the first thing we need to do is get those photos. Um, and in our case, Sun just flew his drone, so we'll get some photos from that. Um, you're gonna use this workflow tab. This is gonna be your go-to tab for processing. Let's go to workflow, add photos. Can you show them how to, where to download the data set before you? Start? Download the photos, yeah, yeah. From, the from the course website. All right, so if you wanna download some photos um, and do this on your own time, you can go to the course website 
which is um, Purdue Brightspeed. I'm not. I'm not logged in. Uh, ah, there we go. Okay, so you're going to go to the course website. We'll go to our summer class, Geomatics Engineering. Content. And um, so the images that I'm going to be using for the demonstration today is this uh, test park subset images. You can download that um, and play with that um, on your own time. Since you have a 30 day trial, you can also take your own pictures of something and, and play with it with that. That would be a lot of fun. All right, so that's how to get the data that I'll be showing you. <clears throat> so back to MetaShape. Let's cancel out of that. Go to your Workflow tab. You can add some photos. And here's you'll go to your Test Park subset images, and you can select all the images and open. You'll see they'll open up pretty quickly, and there's a button up at the top to allow you to see where those images are yeah. I think there is a question from the, you know, what do you put on the company line when you question the trial? So I put Purdue University <laughs> for me. Um, maybe you could put your own company or Purdue University. All right, so the next thing you do, now that we have the, um, now that we have the data, the images in, into the software, we're going to go back to the workflow tab. And again, the workflow tab is your go-to tab. Uh, and hit align photos. And this is the first this is the first thing it's going to do. It's going to try to position those photos in space. And it might take a couple minutes for it to do that process. I've already done it, so let me just jump ahead to um, let me just jump ahead to what would happen. So you, okay. <clears throat> so you hit align photos and go to my model. And the first thing that you'll have here is the sparse point cloud. Right, and you can kind of see that we're starting to create, um, starting to get some 3D information here from our sparse point cloud. And let's, let's uh, play with this a little bit. So we're going to turn on the cameras. And we can see the camera locations for this image. And let me uh, show the thumbnails here for a second. So you can see, if I can navigate, that is positioned all of these cameras up where the UAV was flying. And you can see the strips that we were flying. And from those images, it's found all of these common tie points. And that's your sparse point cloud there. OK, the sparse point cloud can be a little bit we, we, now that we have a sparse point cloud, we want to get something denser. We want more information. Remember, uh, Sun was talking about that ground sampling distance. We want a lot of data per, per um, square area. So let's go to our workflow tab. And the next thing you're going to do is click uh, Build Dense Point Cloud. So this will densify the point cloud. The images have been positioned. Now let's densify it. And I've already done that. It'll, it's going to take, it could take upwards of an hour. Um, for it to process, depending on your system. Um, I've already done it, so we'll just switch over to view that view. And we can see, once it's densified, all of the points that are, are added in. Right. Now, if you're playing with this on your own, um, on your own and you'd like to hang on to this point cloud past the 30-day trial, you can export the point cloud and save it as a different file that you can open up in a different in other softwares. Cloud Compare is a, is a good software. And the way you would do that is you'd hit File, Export, Export Points. Here you would choose a, um, you'd choose a position, <laughs> or I'm sorry, you'd choose a name and a type to save as. And what you're looking for is this uh, ASPRS LAS file. So that allows you to save that 
that point cloud and you can open it up later, even after your trial um, has ended with a different software. All right, so let's, let's create a few other um, products from this. So the first thing we're gonna make is a DEM. So this is, DEM stands for Digital Elevation Model. And that's a 2D image where each pixel represents the elevation. So again, you'll just hit Workflow, DEM, and it might take a couple minutes to, to load. And I've, I've uh, created that, so let me move over to the next project. And here's a picture of, of what the DEM would look like. So in this DEM, each color represents the elevation. Red represents something that's high, Dark blue represents something that's low. And so you can see here how the trees show up in bright red. And if you look at the ground, you can see how this hill shows up in green because you're rising up in elevation. It's a good way to visualize uh, the changes in elevation. There's a, a third product that you can also create and export, and that is the ortho mosaic, the ortho image. So again, you go to workflow and build ortho mosaic. You have to build the DEM first, then the ortho mosaic. So once you build that, again, it might take a few moments to process, but then we can view it here. Now the ortho mosaic, it looks like just a, uh, a picture, right? It just looks like an image, it's a 2D image. But what's different about this is you don't have a single point perspective, like a, like a, a one image. This is more like a map. There's, you don't have the, the perspective. Um, so you can use this to measure distances. And uh, um, Metashape gives you some tools to play around with the measurement. So let's say I hit the measuring tool and you can measure distances. Let's find something interesting. Let's say we want to measure the width of this road here or this driveway. You can, <clears throat> you can measure some distances on there. And in this case, we have about five meters. So that's Metashape, um, but what we're going to do, I want you guys to be able to play with some of this information in real time. You'd have to play with Metashape on your own to build the point cloud. So what we're going to do is, do they have that link available? No, they don't. So I guess if you can follow, follow this link here, I'll leave it up for just a couple seconds so you can type that into your, um, to your search engine, but type that into your um, Internet Explorer there, and that will bring up a, a, a visualization tool that will allow you to play around with the, with the point cloud. So I'll leave that for a second, and then I'll switch over to the visualization tool so that you can um, make, take some measurements. We can talk about it. All right. So let's... <clears throat> pop on over there. And for anyone just joining us, you can still see the, the link at the top here, so you can type that in. And this is the tool to help you visualize this information. So you can see, from 2D images, we created um, 3D information. And this is something that you can take measurements from. And let me show you an example. So if you go over to the measurements tools here, there's a, a bunch that you can play around with. But the one I want to show you is this height measurement. So we'll click that. And then what it allows you to do is you can click somewhere on the ground. Let me get into a better position here. So I don't have to move. All right. All right. So we'll hit the measurement tool will click somewhere at the base of this tree on the ground so it selects a point down there and then we'll select the top of the tree oh did I grab the wrong tool yep. I did I want to grab this height measurement tool there we go so you can see you select two points and it will give you the leg of the triangle there and this tree measures about 8.6 uh, meters so I guess we'll have a, a hot seat question here. And let me zoom out so we can see the tree. So this, see this, uh, 
this third tree here to the north. I want you guys to use the height measurement tool and tell me what measurement, what height you get for this tree. So I'll go to the hot seat pole and start that. So while we're waiting for people to measure, I'll just throw in um, something right here. Since you have a 30-day trial with, with MetaShape, I would, and you're, if you're interested in this stuff, I would take out your cell phone camera, take some pictures of an object or something on the table, and you can process that as well. You might have to play with it a little bit, but there, it's a lot of fun if you're interested in this kind of thing. All right. So we have 10 responses. Mm -hmm. Can't handle the download. Oh, well, maybe you'll be able to play with it after the, after the recording. I'm going to demonstrate how to. There's a question. Okay. How accurate is this? Sun, would you like to, um, and you, you're the one who flew the data, so I don't know how much you want to speak to that. So, uh, where's the question? So, uh, yeah, Gordon B uploaded the question, how accurate is this? You mean the, how accurate is this measurement, I think? And it depends on the quality of your 3D model. It depends on the quality of the camera. But uh, I would say uh, using, your, uh, using most of the uh, current models, camera, UAV thing, uh, it will be within 20, 10 to 20 centimeter, which is uh, about one feet. It will be under that. The errors will be under that point. But in some case, I would say it will be less than five centimeter, two, three inches, I think. I think I would, I would like, like Sun kind of mentioned there, it can depend a lot on the thing that you're measuring too. In this case, we're measuring from grass, which is not a very well-defined surface to the top of a tree, which may not be that well-defined either. So you have a lot more variation there than maybe you were measuring something that was a hard, flat ground. All right. The number's still trickling upward. Maybe I'd we'll take a look at the all right, so let's let's stop here and let's see how okay, and i I got about eight point four meters as well that's what that's what I had, but like we talked about, it's not the best defined object to measure, but it gives you a sense of how we can it is three dimensional information that's the that's the main point of playing with this data, say. This information is reasonably accurate, we can use it, and it is three dimensions. All right. Dr. Jung, I'll turn it over That's to you. you That's all I have. <laughs> well, we are get out, uh, finishing up earlier than we expected. <laughs> okay. I think that's you know, all we prepared today in terms of, um, we started with a session where Dr. Habib you know, talked about you know, what is the geomatics engineering and uh, you know, what is in it, uh, how we do the UAB mapping, you know, 3D mapping using uh, you know, low-cost you know, drones. And after that one, we demonstrated you know, how to collect the data using you know, actual UAB, how to do the mission planning, and uh, actually doing uh, you know, the flight 
and uh, taking off, you know, collecting the data and uh, landing. You know, most of them was in you know, automatic in the, the processing as well. After that one, we collected data and uh, quickly demonstrated you know, how to actually process those images and to generate the 3D model out of it. And uh, to answer you know, the question that you have, you know, how accurate it is, and uh, it can be you know, as accurate as you know, the, you know, sub centimeter or you know, depending on like, you know, the sensor setup or you know, additional effort that we put in, it can be in the order of like you know, the Dr. O mentioned, like you know, 10 to 20 centimeters as well. So it varies, but if you do a you know, super good job, you know, we can get you know, at the sub-centimeter accuracy as well in, in terms of you know, getting a measurement. Also, it also depends on what kind of object, you know, like uh, you know, Joshua mentioned. If you're talking about some kind of soft object like in you know, the grass and you know, trees that is not stationary when you are doing uh, the data collection, it can be some uncertainty over there, but we are talking about in you know, a building height you know, that can be you know, pretty accurate as well. So with that, uh, we are going to you know, wrap up our afternoon session. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think you know, we can use the you know, course website to uh, send us an email. I believe you have an email address of you know, myself, you know, the, uh, Jin ha Jung and uh, Dr. Ayman Habib as well. And I hope you guys had a you know, great time. Dr. Habib, do you have anything you want to add? before we finish this session. Thank you. So good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, so thank you very much for your participation. Uh, and I, hopefully now you got an idea about geomatics engineering, what we are trying to do in geomatics engineering. So as Dr. Zhang mentioned and Joshua and Dr. Sun mentioned, all what we are trying to do actually is to recover metric information, very accurate information from imagery, as well as other modalities. We focus here on imagery, which is captured from UEV systems, and the applications are unlimited. So we talked about here, like doing 3D mapping, you can do the same thing for actually uh, documenting uh, manufacturing science, uh, project management, where you have huge projects where we are trying to evaluate quantitatively the amount of development that took over the, the project over time using UEV imagery, we can do this very accurately. So the, the, the neat thing about the uh, geomatics engineering is that I would say up to 10 or 15 years ago, people who are doing geomatics engineering are like federal government that they are interested in mapping the nation. Right now with the development, the technologies as we've seen that we have a UEV system, not more expensive than $2,000 you can buy from Costco or Best Buy. And you can do very good three-dimensional products that will be suit the application you are interested in. So hopefully that gave you a glimpse, a very quick glimpse of what we can do in geomatics engineering. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And uh, there's one more thing I want to <laughs> say before we you know, wrap up our meeting. And uh, thank you again uh, for joining this afternoon session. And the one thing that I want to mention is that the things that we covered is a you know, tip of the iceberg. And that there is a lot more you know, the magic that is happening behind to you know, going from those 2D images into 3D model. And if you guys are interested in learning more about it, you know, consider Purdue Geomatics you know, Civil Engineering as a, your you know, future you know, choice for your you know, the college. So I just want to mention that for your, you know, for your younger generation that uh, there is uh, so much research opportunity or, and, uh, you know, is you know, in this geomatics engineering. So hopefully you know, some of you, you know, I will have a, you know, the chance to say you know, hi again you know, face to face in the future. And you can mention to me that, oh, I was in the summer camp you know, the other, you know, in a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, this was, and I, hope it, you know, I hope to hear that, that this was the kind of main factor that you decided to come to Purdue. So with that, I want to you know, conclude this in afternoon session. Thank you very much. And uh, hope you see you guys soon you know, face to face in the future. <laughs>